Welcome back to first year undergraduate microeconomics. That's a bit quieter. We're dealing with externalities and externality exists if one person's actions affect another person's welfare, but there is no compensation. In this presentation, we're going to continue exploring how governments can deal with externalities. So far, we've looked at Pigouvian taxes and subsidies. In this presentation, we're going to look at the Coase Theorem, which provides a framework for thinking about innovative ways to deal with externalities through the market. Starting point for the Coase Theorem is to think about externalities as reflecting a lack of property rights. Get around the problem of the externality to bring it into the market so it's no longer external but it's internalised in the market, we want to create a property right. We want to give one person the relevant right and then allow them to trade that right. And by doing this, the market can automatically correct the externality. No need for a tax, no need for a subsidy, no need for any more government regulation. Just create the property right, allocate it, and let the market go. Let's see why this works. The ideas here go back to this man, Ronald Coase, the Nobel Prize winning economist who only died back in 2013. Now, his ideas here were so radical at the time that most economists thought they were wrong. But he's been proved right and his ideas have been implemented in, for example, systems of carbon trading. Let's see how. Here we have a picture of Mr. Rotten, uh, known as John, to his friends. Now, John's responsible for that introductory music we had. He loves loud punk music. And if he plays loud punk, he gets a hundred dollars benefit per day. There's a problem. Here we have a picture of Miss Tikanawa, known as uh, Kiri to her friends. Now, she hates punk music, and unfortunately she lives next door to John. So there's a negative externality imposed on Kiri when John plays punk music. There's no property right. Kiri can't knock on John's door and ask for compensation. John doesn't have to ask Kiri's permission to play loud music. So he plays loud punk, and that leads to a negative externality of, let's say, X dollars per day. We're going to fill in X, and we're going to see how our results change as that value of X changes. Note that if X is less than $100, so the value to John of playing punk music, $100, is greater than the negative externality, then the socially optimal outcome is to have John play punk. There's a net gain of 100 minus X. Of course, if X is greater than $100, so Kiri suffers more than $100 worth of loss when John plays punk, it's socially optimal to stop John from playing the music. He gets $100 worth of benefit, but Kiri loses more than $100. There's a net loss to society. It's better if John doesn't play the music. The government would be able to fix the market failure, the negative externality, if it could put a Pigouvian tax on. The size of a Pigouvian tax would need to be equal to X. There's only one problem. The government probably doesn't know the value of X. Kerry knows how much she suffers when John plays punk, but the government doesn't know. Well, the government could try and ask Kerry, Hey Kerry, tell us how much you suffer when John plays punk. But she'd have an incentive to lie. She'd state a really high number. Because remember, the high number then means a big tax on John, and that means John won't play punk, whether it's socially optimal or not. That means Kiri's always better off because she hates punk music. But you don't get the social optimum. So the government's got a problem. It would like to put a Pigouvian tax on, but it doesn't know the correct size of the tax. Is there a simpler solution? Yes. Suppose the government just gives John the right to play punk. So he's got a property right. He's allowed to play punk unless somebody pays him not to. Now, of course, 
John gets $100 per day value from playing punk, so John will not accept less than $100 to stop playing punk. Let's see what happens. Let's suppose that X is 120. In other words, Kiri gets a $120 negative externality per day when John plays punk. Notice that John and Kiri can do a deal. For example, Kiri might be willing to offer John, say, $110 to stop playing punk. She can pay John for $110. She ends up $10 better off because she gets a saving of $120. She no longer has to put up with $120 loss. Of course, John gets a $10 gain because he would have been willing to accept anything above $100 to stop playing punk. So they can do a deal at $110, or $109, or $108, or $115, or $101, or $119.95. There are gains from trade there. We don't know exactly what the outcome will be of the bargaining process. But as long as bargaining is reasonably efficient between Kiri and John, they'll come to a deal. There's gains from trade sitting there, and if they come to a deal when X is $120, John won't play punk, and that is socially optimal, because the negative externality of 120 outweighs the value to John of playing punk. So by giving John the property right when X is 120, Kiri and John will do a deal, and we'll get the socially optimal outcome. What about if X is only $80? Notice that in this case, the $80, negative externality to Kiri, is less than the $100 gained by John, so it's socially optimal for John to keep playing punk music. Can they do a deal? Well, Kiri's going to offer John something less than $80. Let's say she starts off by offering him $75 to stop playing punk music. Well, John's reaction's going to be simple. No, I get $100 worth of benefit. I'm not going to accept $75. Hmm. What about if Kiri ups her option? What about if she offers $79? to John to stop playing punk music. No, says John, because he's not going to accept $79 when he gets $100 worth of benefit from playing punk. OK, what if Kerry really pushes it? She pushes it to the max. She offers all of her savings. She offers all of her negative externality. She offers John $80, the maximum Kerry's willing to pay John to stop the punk music. Well, John will still say no. He's not going to accept $80 to give up $100 worth of benefit. And Kiri's not going to offer more than $80 when the cost to her of listening to the music is only $80. She's not going to offer $85 to save $80. So in this situation, John and Kiri cannot do a deal. And... That's socially optimal, because X is less than 100. The socially optimal outcome is for John to keep playing punk music. And guess what? The outcome in the market when John has the right to play music in this situation is that he keeps playing music. Now, we can do this for any value of X, and if you do it, you'll find that you always get the socially optimal outcome. So if John has the property right, the right to play punk music, but Kiri can negotiate with John, then they can internalise the externality. John will only play punk when the social value outweighs the social cost. Now, so far, we've given John the property right, and, wow, that might be a bit unfair. Hasn't Kiri got a right to peace and quiet? OK, let's imagine that the government gives Kiri the property right, the right to quiet. So John can only play punk if he knocks on Kiri's door and gets her permission. But she's only going to give him permission to play punk if he compensates her for the negative externality. Let's see what happens. Well, to start, let's suppose X is less than 100. For example, let's suppose that X is equal to $92. What's going to happen in that situation? 
Well, John comes knocking on Kiri's door, asking for permission to play his punk music. And Kiri says, well, that's fine, but you have to compensate me. John says, how much? Well, Kiri's going to pick a number that's at least $92. She could pick 110 John will tell her to go away. But they can keep bargaining. They'll keep bargaining until they come to a price somewhere between $92 the minimum that Curie's willing to accept, and $100, the maximum John's willing to pay. And what do we get? John plays his punk music, and because X is less than 100, that's a socially optimal outcome. But what if X is greater than 100? For example, let's suppose that X equals, let's say, $112. Now what happens when John comes knocking on Kiri's door and asks permission to play his punk music? Kiri will state a price, but her minimum price is 112, so she's going to state a number above $112. She might say $120. But remember, John's only willing to pay up to $100. So he's certainly not going to accept and pay $120 for the right to play punk something he only values at $100. Kiri might lower the price a bit. She might bring it down to $114. But John's still going to say no because it's more than $100. She might bring her price all the way down to $112. But John's going to keep saying no because his value of playing punk is $100. And eventually they'll get sick of bargaining and John's going to walk away and there won't be any punk music played, because Kiri and John can't do a deal. And guess what? That's the socially optimal outcome. So notice that it doesn't depend who gets the property right, whether John has the right to play punk or Kiri has the right to quiet, we get the socially optimal outcome. Now, clearly Kiri and John care about who's got the property right, because whoever's got the property right, they get paid. But under our dollar is a dollar assumption, that doesn't matter. Whether Kiri gets the dollars or John gets the dollars. The key is by allocating the property right, we get to the socially optimal outcome. So what's our takeaway from the Coase theorem? Well, our simple example shows that if we clearly allocate property rights and we get efficient negotiation, then we can internalise the externality. The government doesn't need to do anything more then allocate a property right to fix an externality. But life's often a lot more difficult than our simple example. And often those who are affected by an externality are dispersed. So negotiation will often fail. You're often dealing with, say, one party that pollutes, but many people who suffer from pollution. And it's difficult for all of those individuals to negotiate together. But that doesn't mean that this framework can't be used in the real world. The real point of the Coase theorem is that by thinking about property rights, we can design better schemes to deal with externalities. And a good example is trading of pollution permits. This was pioneered in the United States in California more than two decades ago for dealing with rights to buy and sell sulfur dioxide emissions. That helped reduce the level of pollution in California by ensuring that those parties who found it easiest to reduce emissions did so, or those industries which had the biggest cost of reducing emissions were able to buy permits. They kept on emitting some sulfur dioxide, but they had strong incentives to improve their act and reduce those emissions because the permits were expensive. Around the world, governments are also using the Coase Serum to try and deal with carbon pollution that leads to global warming. The government sets an amount of carbon that is allowed to be emitted and then creates a property right in that carbon so that those carbon rights can be traded. That means that society gets to be a loud amount of carbon emission at the cheapest possible cost. 
Those markets are still being designed. It's an area for future research and for practical application of Foucault's theorem. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next time.